Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a closer look at creating spline paths and spline slices, which will let us take more control over handling multiple splines at once and moving and positioning things along a spline path. And we're also going to implement a way to change the spline path during gameplay. This is a little deeper down the Unity Splines iceberg, and I would say that if you can come to grips with everything covered in this short video, you are now ahead of the curve, no pun intended. If you want to help the channel grow, don't forget to click that like button as we get started. There's a lot to cover today, so let's get into it. I'm going to start by adding a small loop to our existing spline container, and that will create another spline within the container. I started drawing this spline from an existing knot, and that will link both knots. Now, they are unique, but they are connected together, and you're, you'll see in a second, any change I make to one will affect the other. And if I were to draw over them and select both, you'll see that both of them are actually highlighted in this light gray color. And now, if I expand it, you'll see a little bit more information about them. And if I went to change the position, say to five, you'll notice that the other knot in spline number one is also changed. And if you look over in the element inspector, you also see that I have two knots selected. And you can change all these properties here as well for both of them, or you can unlink them, or you can select two knots and link them. Now that we've added another spline to our spline container, we can start talking about how to take a more hands-on approach to following different paths and positioning things along a path. So first, it's important to understand paths and slices. In Unity Splines, a path consists of one or more slices. A slice is a segment of a spline from a particular knot going backwards or forwards by a specific number of knots. This is gonna make way more sense in a minute when we start writing some code. I'm just going to remove the spline animate component from our player follow object because we are totally going to replace that with custom code that will move our object along the spline. So let's get into writing some code here. We're going to make a new class. We'll just call it player follow, same name as the object. And let's move that into its own class. So the first thing we're going to need in here is a reference to the spline container that's holding all of our splines for the path. And let's set a speed that we're going to travel along this. I think something very low is good in this case. We need to create a path. We're going to store that somewhere. So let's make a spline path variable and a few other variables here that we'll just define as we're building paths and as we're moving along them. So in order to follow the path, we're going to make a coroutine and we'll just call it follow coroutine. And we're going to run an infinite loop here. Uh, if you've never seen this kind of notation before, if you don't put a conditional in the signature of your for loop, that means run forever in C sharp and a few other languages. So let's start with a progress ratio of zero since we're just beginning our journey along this path. And then let's make a while loop. So, so long as our progress ratio is less than or equal to one, we're going to continue moving along. So what we need to do is make use of some Unity spline package methods, such as we can evaluate the position of a path based on the ratio of how far along we've gone. And that will give us a position. We can also evaluate the tangent. That'll say what direction we are traveling in. Now we can just set those on our transform. With that out of the way, let's increment our progress ratio. That is simply how fast we're traveling multiplied by time dot delta time. And let's update our total progress, which is actually the ratio multiplied by the total length. Then let's yield return null to get out of our coroutine for this frame. And in start, we can start up our coroutine for one thing, but the other thing we need to contemplate is how are we going to create this path in the first place? And that's really the crux of this video. So the first thing we need is from our container, we can get a matrix, which is a transform matrix we can use to transform any local points on the splines within it into world space. And we need this in order to create slices. So we'll just put that into a local variable uh, you would need a different one for every container that you use, but here we're only using one spline container. Now we can actually define our path. So we can say path equals to a new spline path, and this accepts an array of slices. So let's just say new array, and in here we'll just define a new spline slice of type spline. So this constructor needs to know which spline it's coming from. 
and it needs to define a spline range, which is the knot that it's going to start at and how many knots it's going to go through, including the knot that it started on. And then you also pass in that matrix. Now, if I hold down Alt and Shift and press down, it'll duplicate my line. So the second slice, I want to be on the loop that I just created in the beginning of this video. So that's actually defined in our uh, container array as spline one. We'll go through a loop there, and then we're gonna come back to the original spline at the knot we left on and continue. Yeah, I'll just quickly add a little comment here about the matrix. And then I think we could probably go and try this out. Uh, all we really need to do is add this script to our player follow component and get a reference to our container in there. And that should be all we need. So let's just watch it play through here. Okay, so there's one problem. And let's see, yeah, and jumping ahead a little bit. So our count on some of these isn't quite right on the slices. And I saw one other issue that was that we dipped below the water surface here. So one thing to do is to move those knots on that spline up a little bit. I'll do that first here. I'm just going to change all of them here. I had some negative values there. So bump those up. And then now let's jump over to code because what we need to do to fix those issues is to change the count here on our first one to five and, and this one to six. Now this brings us to an obvious deficiency in the Unity Splines package, and that is that the Spline Path class and the Spline Slice class are not serializable, so you cannot edit them in the editor. So we're going to work around that by creating our own data objects, our own classes. So let's make one here. Let's call it Spline Path Data, and we'll make it system serializable. And all that really needs to have is an array of slice data. So how we want to define each slice for a particular path. Slice data doesn't have to be super complicated in this particular instance because we only have one container. So all we really need here is a reference to which spline inside the container it is. Let's call that spline index. Now spline range can be exposed here. So let's just have another public variable of type spline range. We can set that in our inspector as well. And then beyond that, we probably just need a little bit of extra data, such as is this particular slice enabled or not? How long is this actual slice? And that we can calculate when we're building it. And we could also keep maybe how far away is this slice from the beginning? Now let's expose the spline path data as a serialized field in our player follow class. We'll go back to the inspector, recompile, and have a look, make sure it's what we expect. So we have an array of slices. We can add to them. We can change the data here. We have the range exposed. That looks correct. Uh, you can actually specify forwards or backwards here, which is interesting. And we have our other fields, which are going to be populated by code in a moment. First thing I'm going to do back in here is set enabled to true by default. And now what we really want to do is build a path out of all of our data that where a slice is actually enabled. So let's use some link here to just grab all of our enabled slices from the data. So we can use the where statement and we'll just say where slice is enabled. And let's turn that into a list. I think you could do an array here too, but I think a list is a little bit easier to work with. I'm just going to say one thing about this link statement, and that is you could easily do this with a for loop. Um, I would say try not to use link in update methods or coroutines, where it's ticking off every frame, because there is some overhead. But here, in the start method, it's not really a big deal. So the next thing to do here is define a new list of spline slices of type spline. Now, what we're going to do here is just iterate over all of these enabled slices and we're going to add them one by one to our list and we're going to use that to create our path. So first of all, let's grab our spline from the container and we know what index it is. So let's pass that in there. We're also going to create our actual slice based on the range that we know and we already have our matrix. So now all we have to do is just add it there. Now while we're iterating over each of these slices, we can figure out how far away was this from the start of our path? And 
how long is this particular slice? And then we can add that length to our total length and keep a running total of how long this actual path is. All we have to do then is say path equals to new spline path and pass in that list of splices. And then we can remove this other code. We're going to want to reuse this whole creation of a path many times. So let's extract everything into its own method. I'm just going to grab all this code and control period. Let's extract this into a method. Let's call it calculate path. And it will return our slices. And let's just inline this variable too so it's nice and short. Path equals to new spline path. And we pass in the return value from calculate path. So now we can head back into the editor, recompile. And let's set the data in if I can remember it correctly. We're just going to transplant those hard-coded values into our data here. So uh, for our loop, there was spline index 1. And that was running from the start to a count of 4. Yes. And then we're going back to the first spline. And we were going to travel from, let's see. I think it was from four and went for a count of six to take us all the way back to the beginning. Well, nothing else to do but try it out. So all the paths are enabled. So we should come around to this new loop. We should do the loop one time. And then we should go back onto the main path. I'm just going to hit pause here quickly because I want to look at the values that have been calculated for our slice lengths and the distance from the start. So you can see they're all adding up correctly. And this should give you an idea if you wanted to position things at specific points along a path exactly how you would do it. You can get exact distances based on the ratio traveled along a path. You can spread things out along the path. We had been previously discussing in the comments of an earlier video in this series about how to position things along the spline and move them at a different speed to the player. So hopefully this hands-on approach will give you an idea of how you can use progress ratios to calculate positions for things and move them accordingly. You could easily do this for enemies. Now, I noticed one little problem there, and that was that I didn't have the count quite right on my loop. So I'm going to change that. I'm also going to disable that loop because we need to make sure that that is working. So let's run this again. Now you can already see in the inspector that for our loop element, it hasn't calculated any length or distance because it's not included in our path. Now you'll see we just roll right on by it. So this is doing exactly what we want. Let's stop. So I think what I'm going to do here is implement the simplest thing I can think of to demonstrate how we can change the path at runtime. And that will be down here in our follow coroutine after we've done the first loop. Let's just enable all the loops. So we'll start with our little mini loop disabled, but on the second run through, let's enable everything. All I'll do here is just have a for each loop. And yeah, we'll just turn them all on. And then we calculate a new path, just like we did in the start method. We've already got everything we need. So the only thing left to do here is try it out. While we're trying it out, I just want to mention a few ideas for how you could elaborate on changing the path at runtime. An easy method would be to progressively add more slices to the path as the main circuit is completed, as we've just done. Uh, this could be based on a number of enemies killed or a number of circuits completed. Another way would be to allow the player to make choices at certain points along the path. Since we can now get the length of a path, the distances between slices and knots, and calculate the distance we've already traveled, it's really just a matter of doing some simple math to figure out when you're approaching a potential junction, and then give the player the ability to change the path during that window of opportunity. But use some caution when recalculating the path and the player's progress is not zero because you will have to account for the distance they've already traveled when you're calculating their new progress value on the updated path. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm just going to pause here and have a look. So my second run through here has enabled everything. It looks good. Let's let it come out of its little loop here and make sure it goes back onto the main track properly. Yes, very nice. Okay, one more thing I wanted to mention during this video was an asset that I've just fallen in love with and I used a lot while I was developing 
this particular video because I made so many changes to those blinds and everything. And that is the play mode save asset that I actually bought while it was on sale, but it's still ridiculously cheap, I think. And uh, I use it in every project now. It allows you to basically save all your runtime changes as long as it's a serialized field. So let's go back to the inspector. I just want to show how it works quickly. So you can see I've got the game paused here and I've got a few options in the context menu, save now, save when exiting play mode, which I'll select. I'm just gonna change this count to four and then I'll come out of play mode and you'll see that it will preserve that change because this is serialized data that we've exposed to the editor. If we right click here outside of play mode and we select always save when exiting play mode, check it out in the hierarchy, you see this little red icon here. That means this component has some data that's gonna be saved. So anything serialized on that particular game object is going to be saved at runtime. Now if we jump over here and look at the spline container, for example, this data is not going to be saved at runtime. However, if you were to enable that for this component, it would save your transform position so you could move your overall object around in the world in play mode and that would be fine. Uh, one word of caution, if you're keeping data such as is enabled for your slices and you have this tool running and at runtime that data is getting changed, it is going to get saved. So just be aware of that. But I do find the tool very useful. And uh, yeah, like I said, I use it all the time now. OK, that's a wrap for this video. Thank you for watching and special thanks to my subscribers who have been bumping the channel engagement, whether it's clicking the like button, adding a comment or sharing the video. All of this has really been helping the channel grow. I've got exciting plans for the next upcoming videos, so make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet and click the bell to make sure you don't miss a thing. Thank you again and I'll see you in the comments below.